In listen only mode. Hello everyone, I'm Sean Esterly with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and welcome to today's webinar which is being hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center in partnership with the International Smart Grid Action Network also known as ISCAM. And today's webinar is focused on the PowerShift Atlantic Smart Grid demonstration of a virtual power plant. And one important note of mention before we begin our presentations is that the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solutions Center's resource library as one of many best practices resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. And some of the webinar features that you have for today, you have two options for audio. Um, you may either listen through your computer or over your telephone. And if you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. Uh, doing that will just help eliminate the possibility of any feedback or echo. And if you choose to dial in by telephone, please select the telephone option. And a box on the right side will display the telephone number and also the audio pin that you'll need to dial in. And panelists, just a reminder that we ask you to please mute your audio devices when you are not presenting. And if anyone's having technical difficulties with the webinar today, you may contact the GoToWebinars Help Desk at 888-259-3826. And we encourage anyone from the audience to ask questions at any point throughout the webinar. To do so, uh, just type your question into the question pane and they'll be submitted to me and I can present those to the panelists during the question and answer session following the presentations. If anyone's having difficulty viewing the materials through the webinar portal, you will find PDF copies of the presentations at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training and you may follow along as the speakers present. We will also post an audio recording of the webinar to that site within about a week of today's broadcast. And in addition, we will be posting the webinar to the Solution Center YouTube channel, where you will also find other informative webinars as well as video interviews with thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. And now today's webinar agenda is centered around the presentations from our guest panelists. We have Jennifer Hiscock, Michelle Lossier, and Praveen Rosario. And these panelists have been kind enough to join us to discuss the PowerShift Atlantic Research Project, a collaborative research and demonstration initi initiative that is focused on finding more effective ways to integrate wind energy into our electricity system, with demonstration programs for residential and commercial customers underway across the maritime provinces in Atlantic Canada. And before our speakers begin their presentations, I'll provide a short informative overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center initiative. And then following the presentations, we'll have a, a question and answer session where panelists can address questions submitted by the audience, followed by closing remarks and a brief survey. And this slide provides a bit of background in terms of how the Solution Center was formed. The Solution Center is one of 13 initiatives of the Clean Energy Ministerial that was launched in April of 2011. It's primarily led by the Australia, the United States, and other CEM partners. Some outcomes of this unique initiative include support of developing countries and emerging economies through enhancement of resources and policies relating to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools such as the webinar you are attending today. And there's four primary goals for the Solution Center. First goal is to serve as a clearinghouse of clean energy policy resources. Second is to share policy best practices, data, and analysis tools specific to clean energy policies and programs. Third is to deliver dynamic services that enable expert assistance, learning, and peer-to-peer -peer sharing of experiences. And then lastly, the center fosters dialogue on emerging policy issues and innovation from around the globe. And our primary audience is energy policymakers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries. We also strive to engage with the private sector, NGOs, and also civil society. Now this slide provides um, an overview of one of the marquee features that the Solution Center offers, and that is the no-cost expert policy assistance, which is known as Ask an Expert. And the Ask an Expert program has established a broad team of over 30 experts from around the globe who are available to provide remote policy advice and analysis to all countries at no cost. So for example, in the area of demand and policy evaluation, we are very pleased to have Bruno Lapalone. Vice President and Co-Founder of Enerdata, serving as one of our experts. So if you have a need for policy assistance in demand and policy evaluation, or any other clean energy sector, we encourage you to use this valuable service. Again, this assistance is provided free of charge. 
So to request assistance, simply um, go to cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash expert and submit your request through the Ask an Expert form on that page. We also encourage you to spread the word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. So in summary, we just encourage you to explore and take advantage of the Solutions Center resources and services, including the Ask an Expert uh, technical assistance, the database of clean energy policy resources, subscribe to the newsletter, and participate in webinars like this one. And so now I'd like to provide introductions for today's panelists. The first speaker we'll be hearing from is Jen Hiscock, who is a Science and Technology Advisor for Natural Resources Canada, where she works on smart grid development and the integration of renewable and distributed energy resources. And then our second speaker today, after Jen, um, will be Michelle Lossier, the Program Director of PowerShip Atlantic. Michelle is also the Director of Customer Engagement for Reduce and Shift Demand at New Brunswick Power Corporation. And then our final presenter is Praveen Rosario, and Praveen is the Systems Integration Lead for the PowerShip Atlantic Project through Stantec Consulting. And so with that, I would now like to turn the webinar over to Jen. Thanks, Sean. So before we get started with the uh, uh, PowerShift Atlantic project presented by Michelle and Praveen, I wanted to give you a bit of an appreciation for where this project finds itself within Canada's activities and programs in support of Smart Grid and also within the International Smart Grid Action Network. So for Canada, you can find a fair amount of information in the report we published last year, Smart Grid in Canada for 2012 and 2013. You can see the link at the bottom of the slide here. And um, we've been able to get information on projects across Canada from a number of different funds from political and federal levels. Uh, but uh, what I'm going to talk about today is the first two funds that you see listed there under Natural Resources Canada. So we have the Clean Energy Fund and the Eco Energy Innovation Initiative, Eco EII, and together they provide over 60% of the funding for publicly funded smart grid projects in Canada. And um, so for the Clean Energy Fund, these are five-year demonstration projects uh, where eight of them are specifically looking at smart grid applications uh, with over um, 61 million in smart grid funding. And then the Eco Energy Initiative also funds R&D projects uh, and some advanced studies ahead of uh, larger demonstrations. So together you're looking at 13 demonstrations, four research and development projects and two studies that make up over 78 million in funding and over 210 million in total project value. You can see the links at the bottom of these slides for more information on all of those projects. And uh, something of note that, that might be interesting for our international partners is that, is that these projects include five years of post-completion monitoring. Uh, so that means that we continue to get data out of these projects following their completion to be able to make observations on uh, the influence that they have, if any, on market development, policy development, and regulatory development. So I group these projects from the funds into different categories. Uh, the first one is looking at renewable integration and storage, and you can see that there's a fair bit of activity across Canada in those aspects. Uh, the second area I'm looking at is grid automation and virtual power plants, which is where we find the PowerShift Atlantic project led by New Brunswick Power. These uh, projects categorizations that I've provided, of course, aren't completely clean cut. You could argue that some of these projects could be more storage uh, or they could be more grid automation, but this just gives you a sense of, of where some of the focus is in Canada. The third area I looked at the demonstrations is electric vehicle integration and smart building integration, um, where you can see that we've got uh, four or five sites, um, three through the uh, smart building demonstration project. And again, you can find more information on these, particularly the clean energy fund projects, which have been in place for longer um, through the links online. In terms of research and development, these areas are currently focused on storage, uh, microgrid controls, and demand response, uh, along with their applications to virtual power plants. 
And then to the International Smart Grid Action Network, as Sean mentioned, this is a, another initiative like the Clean Energy Solutions Center. Uh, so it was born through the Clean Energy Ministerial and then became one of the implementing agreements under the International Energy Association and CanMet Energy with Natural Resources Canada is the official signatory to that implementing agreement. And so we represent Canada at that level. We joined 24 other countries uh, in ISDAN with uh, invitations sent out to further countries. We're always looking at uh, adopting new members into ISDAN. Um, and the focus is very much on uh, getting information out of the experiences of these different countries and turning it into policy advice um, and advice for uh, program managers and developers uh, and, and practitioners as well. The way that ISGAN organizes its work is into annexes, where there were the first four foundational annexes, um, and then the next uh, five, six, and seven annexes focus on more specific uh, capabilities, such as um, uh, research on standards development through um, the R&D networks in specialized national labs. Uh, so the work that w this product is, uh, this is a product of is Annex 1 and Annex 2, looking at the smart grid inventory and the smart grid case studies. In each case, the materials that we produce under these different annexes are trying to take things from what we already have at an international level in sort of an abstract or a rough framework idea and turning it into specific applications and policies that we can see in our, uh, in our various levels of government and cities around the world. So you can find the further information on the PowerShift Atlantic project that we're talking about today within the latest casebook that was developed on demand management, uh, available at the link you see provided. And it's also one of the many projects that are listed from all 25 countries within the ISGAN Smart Grid project catalog. And that gives you a sense of where a lot of the global investment is going. With that, I'll let Michelle explain more about PowerShift Atlantic. Just a reminder, Michelle, that you're still on mute. Thank you. Okay, we're good? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, apologize for that. We, we're just getting started here. So thank you, Jen, and thank you, folks. Praveen and I will give you a good update on, on our PowerShift Atlantic project here. Uh, one of the big things I want to start with um, is, is these projects, specifically with PowerShift Atlantic, where we're talking about engaging customers in smart grid technology. These projects are 80 to 90 percent customer and 10 to 20 percent technology. As an industry, most of our projects in the past have been probably the, the, the reverse. A lot of technology for customers in the end. But this virtual power plant, this intelligent load management, starts with the customer's homes, businesses, and industries. Therefore, it's a lot about the customer and less about the utility so we start at the other end and work our way back. So nothing against the techno technolo technology folks. I think they're all important. It's just really it's, it's a complete shift and, and, a, and a transformation of our way of thinking as, as a utility. Um, so yeah, getting into PowerShift Atlantic, I think we've got uh, some, uh, an interesting presentation here to, to discuss wind integration via load shifting. We're in the Atlantic provinces, uh, eastern Canada. We've got great wind regimes and, uh, and an ability to cap some of that wind, but obviously there, there are limits to how much wind we can bring on at any one time based on the dynamics of the system. So looking at, uh, at where we are, relatively speaking, total wind in, in uh, Canada today is about 8,200 8, megawatts of that, of that order, uh, which you know, started about the year 2000 and has ramped up ever since. That will about double in the next, uh, I'd say, in the next five years. Uh, rep today represents 2% of our total energy, be 63% being hydro in Canada, 15% nuclear, and then the rest. 
So this today represents around 2% of our total energy picture. If you look at the maritime provinces, you're looking at in the order of 800 to 850 megawatts of, of wind power. Uh, on a peak of about 5,200 megawatts in the Maritimes and a mid around 22, 2,300 megawatts. So, you know, we're getting upwards of, uh, of uh, on a windy day, we, on, a, on a low, low day, which is, we, we're getting up around 40%, 50% potentially at any one time, which is a significant penetration of wind, probably as significant as anywhere in North America. So a project like PowerShift Atlantic and that enables us to look at solutions perhaps to better integrate the wind and integrate more wind as we go forward down the road. Project's vision and goals is, is determine if shifting patterns in energy consumption through load shifting can enable us to effect, more effectively integrate wind, as I said. Is load shifting cost effective and reliable? So we look at hot water heaters, thermal storage, and energy manage, management uh, systems in buildings. Uh, how is load shifting, how load shifting performs in sync with system balancing? Forecasted wind power, day ahead, hour ahead, 10, 15 minutes ahead, and understanding the customer's role with these new technologies. We, today we have in the order of 1,270 customers and 16 megawatts of connected load working on a virtual power plant today installed. So that's what we're working with today. A lot of this load is load that can be shifted, so customers can be kept business as usual, but can be shifted in correlation with when the wind is blowing or a better time for the overall system performance. Next slide, the participants uh, working with Natural Resources Canada, a co-funded, uh, NB Power is the lead proponent with Nova Scotia Power, Maritime Electric, St. John Energy, University of New Brunswick, system operator. Uh, the uh, project manager and, and integrator, Stantec, Acreon, and Lidos. The aggregators, uh, you might have seen some of these names, Stephens Corporation, Integral Analytics, University of New Brunswick, and then Ballot Power Networks, End Use Connectivity, Dequentrix, Dimplex, Tantalus, Timbala, Stephens, and Bell Alliance. But we start to see, we start thinking words like interoperability, integration, standards form, open platforms. These are the kind of players that are starting to, to, to get intertwined in what we would call a virtual power plant, and uh, we'll, Praveen will talk more about that. Moving on, NB Power in Atlantic Canada. It runs with power, um, vertically integrated utility, 330,000 customers in eastern Canada. We peak at 3,100 megawatts. We have a diverse generation supply. We've got a 700 megawatt nuke. We've got 900 megawatts of hydro, running about 30% capacity factor. Uh, we have about 300 megawatts of wind on our system, but we also balance Prince Edward Island and Northern Maine. So when we look at that peak of 3,100 megawatts, we have 1,500 megawatts of electric baseboard heat on peak, and approximately 150 megawatts of electric hot water on that peak of 3,100 megawatts. So that's potentially shiftable load down the road, or a portion of that is. But we've got a very peaky system in the winter because of that electric baseboard heat. We peak in the summer around 16 or 1700. We will min at around 950. Two nights, or a week ago, when we had relatively cooler nights, we were we were about 950 megawatts. So if you got a 700 megawatt nuke on, and we have 300 megawatts of wind, and a couple, and say 300 megawatts coming down the river, we've got 1300. Perhaps our coal plants on at minimum 1500 on a thousand megawatt night. We have to manage those renewables very, very intelligently to get the maximum value for them. So storage becomes a, a huge asset uh, because wind obviously will, will work with the dynamics of the system, your max and min loads and, and what's actually taking place because we're not curtailing nuclear. And that, that's kind of how we're, we're operating the system. But if you look at this, this slide, the entire region peaks at around 5,200 megawatts, min's around 22, 2,300, and we've got in the order of, I think that's closer to 900 megawatts of wind today between the three provinces. Uh, Prince Edward Island has, has a huge wind regime. Uh, we're sitting at about 8% energy in New Brunswick, and I believe Nova Scotia is probably around 10% wind energy as a total today. So good potential, potential for more, but the need for better products. Uh, the typical home in New Brunswick, 60% space heating and cooling, so and water heating about 20%. So your average home 
in New Brunswick, because of the, the uh, electric baseboard heat and electric hot water heating, it's 70 to 80 percent of the electrons flow into those homes is in those two areas. Well, there's huge potential there, and as New Brunswick Power, we rent, we have a rental program for 220,000 electric hot water heaters. We have about 80% of the market captured. So well, that's a huge opportunity. Because some of these customers we've got connected on hot water still get hot water. They don't even, it's business as usual. We're just heating that hot water at a better time for the system, for the overall system. So, you know, I think the, 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 this starts to demonstrate uh, in New Brunswick per se, uh, why there's a huge business case or potential for this type of product that, that, and that the project power shift. So moving on, uh, Praveen Rosario is going to talk about our virtual power plant and some functionality and get into some architecture. So Praveen. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, so we'll, we'll first start by looking at the, uh, the evolution of the, uh, the BPP concept itself. I think it's a good place to start and then we can dive a little bit into the, the design and the architecture. Uh, so, the, so we know traditionally the, uh, the, the bulk power system as we know it uh, operates in such a way that uh, generation assets are uh, planned and dispatched to meet consumer demand on the fly. So it's, always, so it's the convenience of the, the customer at the end of the day and, and uh, they, they, they don't, uh, they're, they're not inconvenienced in any way and that's, that's how the, uh, the, the model works. Uh, the, mo the moment you start integrating renewables like wind energy, uh, you have you have the the task of using uh, the combination of your conventional generation resources, which are which uh, which you can plan for and dispatch at a, in a controlled fashion, uh, along with your uh, more unpredictable renewable resource like wind, uh, and you still have to balance that to to meet that same c consumer demand without any inconvenience to the customer. So there's uh, there's obviously some balancing. Uh, challenges associated with that. Uh, and traditionally, we have other support ancillary services that aid with that today. So you have your, your regulation and a bunch of other things that, that uh, usually mitigate some of that uh, uh, variability associated with it. Uh, so the first thought that, uh, that came to mind was, uh, let's assist with some of that uh, variability win by performing a purely win following service uh, using, using load shifting. Uh, so what that means is basically, track to that wind generation, either a forecast or some other signal, uh, and use, use your, your consumer load uh, to basically track to that, and in that way, ease some of the, uh, the stress on your conventional generation. Uh, we soon found out that uh, this may not be the best way uh, to achieve this uh, uh, for, for, the, for the main reason that we could be introducing new system demand peaks on the grid, and uh, that could happen because you have uh, a, coinc a coinciding uh, wind peak, and then at the same time, if you happen to have a system peak to begin with, you're going to drive that peak even further if you have a purely uh, wind following service, and that's uh, definitely not desired. So we we continued, uh, you know, we put our thinking caps back on, and then we decided, okay, can we can look at it, look at this in a slightly different way. So we look at the same power balance equation, and uh, we took we take the uh, the wind generation component from the left hand side to the right hand side of the equation, and uh, what that leaves us is basically. Uh, the demand on the system that has to be powered by a conventional generation now after taking into account what the wind can power. So this new uh, profile of load minus wind is uh, basically what we decided to optimize to. And uh, in smoothing that leftover profile, we, uh, we thereby reduce the strain on your conventional generation. And uh, obviously that allows for the, uh, the adoption of wind. So as we look at the, the components of that equation, again, you have your, con your conventional generation resources, which are controllable, dispatchable. You have your uh, consumer base, uh, which is basically a portion of which, through this program, which uh, we, we get to be uh, partially controllable. And then you have your wind generation, which is uh, weather dependent. Uh, we take it as it comes, use the best we know today with the different forecast models, and then uh, balance the system uh, after the fact. A, the, the final proposed solution that uh, we ended up adopting is basically uh, use the uh, load control to shift some of that demand around to reduce the effects associated with the variability of wind generation. Um, and this is, uh, we'll talk about it a little bit more as we uh, get into the, uh, the functions of the VPP. Uh, and as we do this, we develop a new tool to allow the system operator to more easily and efficiently balance the grid 
and thereby uh, um, definitely allow for the more integration of uh, renewables. Uh, if we go back a slide, so if we go back to that uh, power balance equation here, and again we, we, we note that even if the wind generation turns out to be zero, the, uh, the solution works in such a way that it would still smooth out that profile, whatever that profile ends up being, uh, to reduce the stress on conventional generation. So the solution is such that if you take wind out of the equation, it still works. It still aids in assisting the system operator with its balancing and planning operations. So just to put a little illustration to what we're talking about here. So if you look at the, uh, the load profile, so this is again, uh, think of this as the profile that's left over to be serviced by your conventional generation resources uh, after taking into account what the wind can power. Uh, you see, you notice that the before has some significant noticeable peaks and, and dips. And so you'd have your conventional generation basically trying to follow that. Uh, with our VPP solution, we try to smooth that profile out. Um, and then you look at the after case, it's a lot smoother. and so. To suddenly the, uh, the the planning for the system operator is going to be around this curve uh, as opposed to the before curve and so that obviously makes things a lot easier for them so the uh, the idea is to even out that energy use and then make the the, uh, the integration of renewables easier uh, the the end-to-end -end solution uh, that we have today uh, we have your system operator talking to the virtual power plant so what, what it does is it basically provides the, uh, the load minus wind forecast signal to the VPP. Uh, the, we have aggregators sitting on the right-hand side of the virtual power plant. So these are the guys that are contracted to provide the, uh, the forecast and control of consumer loads. Uh, usually we have them in groups today. We call them load classes. Uh, but basically what they do is they, they provide forecasts of what the uh, what is available to the VPP uh, for shifting and uh, basically what happens downstream uh, as a result of the shifting because we are dealing with uh, purely energy storage devices at the end of the day. So as Michelle mentioned earlier, we're looking at uh, things like water heaters, uh, pumping stations, uh, HVAC, mod HVAC uh, systems, uh, everything's got an energy storage component to it. So it, it is truly shifting and balancing that energy through the course of a day or, you know, or whatever the, uh, the uh, duration cycle is for that particular device. Uh, so as we see here, there's, uh, there's bi-directional flow uh, between the VPP and all components on both sides. Uh, we'll get a little bit more into the, uh, the architecture now, of what, a little more uh, deeper look into what's under the hood, if you will. Uh, so as you can see here, the VPP uh, has, a, has a few components. The, uh, there's two interfaces on either side talking to your aggregators and your system operator. Uh, the interfaces are uh, what define our basic open architecture concept of the, the VPP. So we have project, uh, project specifications that were written to basically define what these uh, interface requirements would be. And uh, the job for the aggregators that came on board was basically to conform to that specification. So they had to come to the table and uh, conform to this uh, project specification rather than bring in their their uh, proprietary you know uh, solution. So there was there was definitely a challenge for them in that regard. But what this helped us do is we were able to open the table to multiple players. We were able to get multiple different kinds of solutions uh, integrated to the VPP, and uh, definitely helped in uh, widening our base. We have the same idea on the right-hand side with the system operator. So today we have the two virtual power plants by balancing area. We have one under New Brunswick power and uh, the other one under uh, Nova Scotia power. Um, the idea is the same. It's all open web services that define that interface. Uh, the other important um, modules within the VPP, uh, we have an executive control module, which basically orchestrates all the processes that need to happen that uh, allow the functioning of the VPP. And that's all in you know open source uh, software. Uh, same thing for the data management subsystem, which is basically the, the database holds, houses all the data that, that's needed for the VPP functioning. We have a dispatch optimization and control subsystem, 
which basically uh, runs all the optimizations necessary to provide the VPP with its functionality. And we also have some uh, a little logging and alerting subsystem. It's nothing fancy, but it provides some sort of logs to uh, what what happens um, on on a, on a fairly fairly high resolution. And we also have a graphical user interface that uh, that is made available to the VPP uh, administrators and the system operator. So they get a snapshot of what the VPP is doing, what its load control plan is going forward, and it also provides uh, control to the system operator. So now we talk about the functions. Uh, the primary function uh, is basically assisting the system operator's job of balancing the grid. So that's that function we were talking about where we, there, we smooth out the profile. Uh, we call that load shape management. And uh, this is the, uh, the automatic, almost like a cruise control mode of the VPP, the default mode when it's powered up. Powered up. It uh, basically, uh, when you think of it as a power plant or a virtual power plant, it adjusts its output once every 15 minutes. Uh, it's, it's, as I said before, it's automatic. It's not event driven. It's a closed loop continuous system, and that's where it goes beyond your typical DR type product. It's, uh, that's why we use the word dynamic DR. It's definitely one of those things that happens continuously on its own, no intervention. Uh, this, the secondary function that we have with the VPP, which is basically providing the equivalent of a 10 minute spinning reserve of uh, ancillary type service. This is um, a manually invoked function, so it's, it's uh, at the discretion of the system operator. And when, when it is requested, um, the, the capacity that is requested is made available within 10 minutes, and it's uh, sustained for a whole hour uh, after the fact. This is basically um, just like a typical ancillary services. Uh, the idea is call, it, call on it when you need it in terms of a contingency or other support capacity on the grid. Uh, the, the primary function uh, if you look at it in a graphical uh, simulation, so you look at the, the original forecast shape, which is your blue solid line. So that's basically uh, your load minus wind signal. So as you can see, it's got some, it's, it's fairly noisy. It's got its dips, it's got its peaks. Uh, the, the primary function of uh, load smoothing would uh, basically convert that shape into the smoother red dotted line. And so this is the information that's going back to the system operator. And ideally, if it was integrated back into the utility operation, they'd be looking at this and like, yeah, so the VPP is going to do that. Let's plan our conventional generation around this. The, uh, the secondary function, real-time generation dispatch. So this is where we have a bidirectional capacity that's published to the system operator uh, available for the ancillary uh, dispatch. Uh, the example shown here is for a, um, an art, a real time generation dispatch up. Uh, now keep in mind that since we're talking about virtual generation here, a generation up is equivalent of a load shed, and uh, the generation down is equivalent of a load restore. So as the graph clearly illustrates, once the RTGD is initiated, uh, the capacity requested is made available within 10 minutes, and you can see that consistent load shed for a whole hour after the fact. Uh, once this is uh, once this is elapsed, uh, the system returns back to its default mode of uh, load shape management. And uh, now I'll pass the ball back to uh, Michelle and talk a little bit more about the customer participation. Okay, thank you, Praveen. Um, yeah, that's great. One of the uh, things on the, uh, the virtual power plant is it's a research and demonstration project, so it's not a fully commercialized product. So uh, you know there there were uh, opportunities to to when we designed this to, uh, to actually take it from scratch, but but again uh, we we worked it within within the constraints of the project, and one of the key parameters was to have a functional end-to-end -end system within the, within the confines and the you know the financial parameters of the project. Which uh, so we're glad to say that it does work. Uh, one of the key things that I think Praveen mentioned, and I'll repeat, is that if the wind doesn't blow for four days and it's the coldest days of the year, um, this will put, uh, you know, our water heaters and thermal storage units in valleys versus on peak. Uh, it will automatically look to, to, to do this, this, this shift. Um, what's good about that is customers, again, don't, aren't aware. For customers, it's business as usual, but it has a dual purpose. And as a vertically integrated utility, both have tremendous value 
uh, whereas in a market setting, each product could be sold separately as a vertically integrated utility. We can look at this entire package and say what has the most value. So this, this VPP has the ability to do both. And, uh, and, and it's as important in some jurisdictions to increase the load to put a generator in the sweet spot if it's running at, at, at a poor efficiency. And that's also something that virtual power plants are being worked towards is, is how do we get the generation units more in the sweet spot. And there are utilities doing that today. So there's a host of products here. Again, uh, the key is, is, is less fossil dependency, uh, integrating more renewables, and, and, and offsetting the need to build down the road. So it's, it's really an optimization. So looking at the customer participation, we, you know, and, and, and what customers have told us all along on this project is we'd like to see more renewables. And as we, we interviewed them and, and worked with them, they said, we'd like more renewables. We'd like to see less fossil over time. And we're glad to be part of a project like this. But uh, keep the lights on and, and don't raise the rates. So I mean, when we hear things like that as a utility business, we can't, as, a, as an industry, shave peaks alone anymore. If we're going to offset the need to build and run a, a system much more intelligently, we have to work in partnership now with our customers. It's no longer a one-way conversation. And that's a whole new game and a transformation for the utility industry. And I'm sure most would agree with that. So we're, today we're at 1,270 customers, approximately 16 megawatts, and working our way to 18 megawatts. Uh, the breakdown of that, if we look at the end uses, um, Stephis uh, Corporation, Space Heating out of the U.S., 94 residential, 147 devices, 1 megawatt of connected load. On the commercial side, 15 uh, customers, 40 total devices for about 0.2 megawatts. Uh, Dimplex, Glen Dimplex out of, out of the UK, 138 residential customers, 353 units installed. These replace baseboard he electric baseboard heaters, one, approximately one megawatt of load, connected load. People had to get used to a new form of heating. Now we've had, Stephens have units in Nova Scotia, probably eight to 9,000 units in Nova Scotia that were primarily used for valley killing and peat shaving. But this is a whole new dimension looking at renewable integration with these, uh, these ETS units. And the commercial thermal storage, we've got 27 customers with 86 devices and about 4.6 megawatts. So again, that's, that's heating load, it's winter load, it's probably five months of the year. Moving on, the end uses, and Bala Power Networks, who I'm sure some are familiar with, they're working with PJM and in different areas across North America. Uh, aggregating ancillary products, HVAC refrigeration pumping station, 25 commercial customers, 25 devices for a total of 5.5 megawatts. And when we look at water heaters, Integral Analytics, UNB, and Stephis Corporation, instrumented and uninstrumented water heaters for a total of about 1,000 of those in total and uh, I'd say 3.4, 3.3 megawatts in total. So looking at water heaters down the road, you know, the electric water heater that's instrumented versus not uninstrumented, you get a lot more ability to play with an instrumented water heater and you can, you, you, you can take more risk and keep customers in hot water versus uninstrumented. The issue is right now instrumented water heaters are a little more expensive and they, as we put thousands upon thousands of them out in the next years ahead, which I believe they will become that way, they will get more cost effective. That's good baked in shiftable loads but instrumentation will be very important to have, but again, cost-effective instrumentation over time. So we need to really look at how we can, we can replace our electric water heater fleet with instrumented hot water heaters going forward. And I know a lot of electric hot water heater companies are, are, are working on this, this R&D right today. And we've got Sequentrix, Tantalus, and, and Dimplex also uh, into, the, into the aggregation of these devices. Uh, so again, 1,270 megawatts, 18 or customers, 18 megawatts across the uh, the Maritimes. Now that's not a huge load, but it, what, we, what we're looking at here is we, if we get down to doing a business case in the long run, is is the upscalability of this, and, and what would that mean going forward, and what is the potential of shiftable load? How much do we have? This is a product that I think could be expanded, and it may not be all loads that have this shiftability. Uh, however, there are many, and uh, it's, it's to really start to take advantage of those in the long haul. Talk about open architecture and common interface, interoperability. As standards form, 
um, the variety of end use pro providers, variety of aggregators, and how to bring all those back into an open open architecture. What was really interesting when we when we started working with the aggregating companies uh, with an open architecture, as we worked with them individually, and as we went out and even tested the market for this open-ended platform, everybody wanted us to use their platform because they all had a solution, a ready solution to be a virtual power plant. And what was really important for us is to push back as we were doing this and say, we've got an open-ended solution and we need you to interface to it. And uh, there was, a, you know, I think a little give and take there, but eventually these companies uh, all came to the table and, and provided that interface, which when we start seeing utilities, whether local distribution companies or vertically integrated utilities in the long term, starting to build these open platforms or a market setting, an open platform to bring in different sources of aggregation, the standards and uh, you know the interoperability and connectivity of all these products, uh, standards will be very important because obviously the less of the less adjusting that aggregation companies have to do to open standards, the more cost effective some of these solutions would be in the long term. So there's more work to do there, especially in the next generation demand response. I think a lot of these companies were very good at demand response. Uh, but uh, dynamic demand response is, is a different kettle of fish, and, and uh, obviously some of them are doing it today, but not all, and, and so working that was important. Also working more intimately with customers and getting to understand the, the ability of a customer to partake in this project, uh, keeping them with hot water and heat, but, but not abusing uh, the use of, of those loads uh, it is, again, a new dimension for aggregation companies. Uh, on the other side of the meter. It's really getting to know the customer and making sure that what, what the load we're tapping into is available. So uh, some, some loads were all year round, some were seasonal. And for the most part, customers uh, have been very, very forthcoming. Um, looking at a few photos here quickly, electric baseboard to thermal storage, uh, a new form of heat. Our customers did value, uh, again in New Brunswick, we have 1,500 megawatts of electric heat on a peak of 3,100 megawatts. So one can imagine these things all come on on peak. And uh, these thermal storage units have the ability to come on off peak, but also to follow wind more effectively. So there, there's a huge advantage there. And for customers, they, they enjoy the heat that these things throw versus the baseboard heating. They, they like the, the comfort levels better. So some of them actually wanted more of them, which was a good sign. Uh, but again, uh, on, a, on an outright retrofit to a home, it's more costly. On a new construction or potentially you know, starting to penetrate the marketplace with this product in the long haul where we have cold climate, provides shiftable load. You know? So as we go forward, we start to see applications for policy. Electric vehicles will be in that, in that, er in that area as well, just potential for, for storage. Looking at the next, I think these are just a few photos of, uh, of, you know, we have to keep the customers happy. We have to install these so that they're pleased with them. It's not everybody that wants them right away. So again, it's, 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 it's making, it's a customer project because these, these virtual power plants are in customers' homes and businesses. So it, it's, uh, it's a whole different equation uh, when it comes to that. And this is thermal storage in, in the school. There's a half a megawatt of thermal storage at, the, uh, in, in, at this school. It's hydronic hot water systems uh, heated with bricks, stethos units, large stethos units. Huge opportunity, also good opportunity to, to in, in, engage the school with, uh, with something pretty neat. This is our Woodstock office. These are HVAC, uh, these are air, air heating systems. Uh, and I'll get to the next slide. They're basically just you know, high density bricks that, get, that heat up on the, on the, uh, when the wind blows. Or, on the back shift in the valleys. Moving on, I think you know we talked a little about this um, as a utility going from a commodity, and this is one of the project powers vision is going from a commodity supplier to an energy services provider at the other side of the meter um, takes a whole new level of trust. I think we we as a utility have have gained the trust of, of our customers for reliable, cost effective. Um, Safe electricity, uh, for the most part, you know, it's not like it's, it's a perfect world out there, but we've done a fairly good job at that as an industry. But this new world going on the other side of the meter 
it's a new conversation for us. And, and I don't know if all our customers see us in this space yet going beyond the meter, but it's very critical that we continue to build trust with our customers today going into tomorrow because we've got to go beyond the meter now and, uh, and really have a level of conversation with our customers to render a better overall end-to-end -end system. And they can really help us with that, but we have to help them with their, within their lives so they can help us. So that will be new products and services. It will be an energy services company versus just a commodity electron sales company. And it's, it's really getting to know our, our segments, our customers way more effectively than we do today, and building that partnership uh, to the future. Um, one thing you can think about, and I think the whole of the utility industry is thinking about this, as solar continues to grow and you know customers are generating their own electricity, let alone using less and using it smarter, one can only imagine the utility companies staying at the electricity commodity stage, uh, what could happen in the long run. And that's already beginning to happen. So it's a whole new conversation. It's a customer project with technology, very different than our previous project. Uh, moving on, I think this is pretty self-explanatory. Efficiency programs, you get continuous reducing. Behavioral, from a, you know, a peak shaving to a valley filling, perhaps through pricing signals. We've seen a lot of that. The lower one we're talking here is about trust, where we actually have an ongoing connection to hot water heaters and thermal storage systems, and we're making sure people don't run out of hot water. Uh, could be an energy management system as well, or water pumps. In, in municipalities that, that uh, Mbala has connected to. Basically, it's a question of trust. So it's making sure that it's customer first all the way and then back into the utility for the products that we need, but customer first. And again, uh, I think most customers own NB Power. We're vertically integrated utility. So again, another piece here where, where customers were, were pleased is the ability to promote their part of this project, whether a municipality or a, a grocery chain or whatever it may be, there's a huge value to being able to say people are part of a, a, a renewable green theme and they're, they're proud of it. And uh, that has a huge value to a lot of our customers beyond just pricing signals. Uh, and it's thinking about what do customers value and how do we as a utility make them make their day and help them in their cause to be more corporately social response, more corporate social responsibility and be part of that. That, that, that has huge value. So again, it's, it's understanding what, what do customers value and how do we play into that going forward, just like any other market. Uh, we've won a few prizes, uh, a few awards with PowerShift Atlantic, the Canadian Electricity Association in 2012, the Sustainability Award, uh, Canadian Wind Energy Association, RJ Templin Award 2012, and recently in Denver, the Peak Load Management Alliance for Innovation in DR. So we're very, very pleased with that. But again, there's, there's still a lot of work to do, and we're learning a lot of things, but uh, there's a lot of work to be done to continue to innovate. Um, and really, to close, I mean, we're, we're four years into this project. We're, we're going to be looking at, you know, a final report, business case, that's all coming. But I think this last slide really illustrates the, the future where the, where the past meets the future. And our bulk generation, if you look at our virtual power plant, it sits between the bulk generation and the, the distributed energy resources. We're still going to need both for quite some time, but the conversation is quickly shifting to the right-hand side of this slide, uh, whereas for years we talked a lot about the left-hand side because that's where 75 to 80 percent of our costs are in the utility business. Now it's really about energy efficiency, DR, DG, because we want to offset the need to build. We want to better run that fleet. We don't want to burn as much fossil, and we want to integrate more renewables. So how do we engage with, with customers going forward to ensure we can do all of that. And, uh, and as people in, you know, start putting up their own distributed generation more and more as an industry, you know, that partnership with our customers will be, will be absolutely essential. So uh, anyhow, that's, uh, that's a bit on PowerShift Atlantic. And uh, I'd just like to close. The, the building this trust with our customer base going forward is essential. Uh, these are customer projects with technology. And, and I think that you know, we've got to start at this. And, uh, and there's a lot. There's a long way to go. That's it on my end. Great. Thank you to um, Praveen and Michelle and also Jen for the presentations.
Um, and we will move on now to the question and answer session. And just a reminder to the audience, if you have any questions for the panelists, you can type those into the question pane and go to webinar window. Um, and the first question that we've received so far uh, asks, are there any special rates or incentives offered to the customers to participate in the load shedding program? Um, good question. For this project, uh, no, there, there, there are not. But we, as part of the project, we installed the, the devices um, and, and the equipment uh, in, in people's homes and businesses. Uh, we, you know, th part of this project will be to determine, you know, what is the value of, of, of these ancillary products and, 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 and the products in the homes. Uh, going forward, there very well could be and some type of, a, of, of, of rate scheme going forward. Uh, but again, it, you know, it, what will it take for us, I guess, going forward to, to get customers to engage in, in large numbers? That's something that I think some of the results from this project will tell us. What we did find that was, that was uh, interesting was, you know, we had a really huge demand for these, these units and people were very forthcoming to be part of this project. And, and uh, I mean, it surprised us in a way because we weren't sure what to expect. So we, we, if anything, we had to turn people away. So, I mean, it's a good sign, but again, I think it's a great question. What's in it for me? People are asking that, and, and, and we continue to get that question. Down the road, what would be in it for me? Because uh, there's got to be something in it for you. So how do we get to that place, right? Great. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, next question. Um, could you please clarify if with the common system operator platform, if you have two system operators accessing the same virtual power plant, or if there are two virtual power plants and you just wanted to standardize the ISO interface? Yep, so that's a, that's a very good question. So the way it works is uh, it's a, uh, a system level two. It goes by balancing area, and it's one VPP per balancing area. So there's one under uh, New Brunswick Power, and we have another one under uh, Nova Scotia Power. So that's that's the uh, that's the way it works. Thank you, Praveen. Um And to date, what is the return on investment, or is it negative since the projects uh, demonstrate? I, I I can take that one. I think that it's early it's early to tell. Um, what I can say is. Some of these products will obviously will have a greater return than, than others. Um, what we're seeing here, obviously, there's a few things. One is aggregation is evolving. Next generation aggregation is evolving, and and there's still work to do in that on that front. I, I also believe that the cost of products that are that will be deployed out there over time will come down. Example hot water heaters, as well as um, there's a potential to bake in a lot of shiftable load here over time through policy um, as we start to see these virtual power plants or intelligent load management systems crop up, we start to see potential that we didn't have in the years past because we didn't have a renewable integration problem 10, 20, 15 years ago and now we have an opportunity. So when we start looking at whether it's EVs, or future products that we want to put into the marketplace, how can we drive that through policy so some of these costs can come down? Uh, to, to, be, to be blunt about it at this stage, we won't really know some of these numbers till the end of the demonstration phase, which should be in, in I don't know, four to six months from now where we have that business case report complete. But uh, there are trends. One we're seeing is there's still work to do with aggregation and some of the product costs need to come down, but as well, I think we need to start to convert the way we're thinking about products and services, and the marketplace will, will migrate to this as we, as we position value propositions out there that just make sense for this to, to, to expand over time. So I, 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 don't, I think I gave a, a bit of a roundabout, but uh, you know, uh, I don't think some of, some of these things aren't too far away. What's really attractive for us at NV Power is, like I say, we've got, you know, we've got in the order 220,000 electric hot water heaters out there, and we have a coincidental peak of 150 megawatts on the peak with just hot water heating and 1,500 megawatts with space heating. So there's some real low-hanging fruit for us going forward, you know, to offset the need to build that new plant down the road and, and to better integrate wind.
Great. Thank you, Michelle. We have two more questions, so if we can keep the, um, the responses to about one minute for each of them, we should be able to get to both. Uh, the first question is, how much time in advance is the load shedding signal sent to customers? And after the signal is sent, is the load shedding done automatically under the control of the utility with or without overriding capability by the customer? Okay, uh, so the, the way it works today is uh, the VPP sends out a signal once every 15 minutes uh, to the aggregator. So it's basically a dispatch instruction. Uh, and the aggregator has to act upon it immediately, as, as soon as they receive it. Um, and uh, so they send their control signals out to the uh, customer devices. And uh, the, the devices are manipulated continuously under the discretion of the aggregator uh, to best satisfy the instruction from the VPP. Uh, they report back, um, today the way we have it is uh, they report back as frequent as once a minute, uh, letting the VPP know how, how they did, basically, um, in uh, response to that instruction. Uh, as far as a customer override goes, I think the way it works is, I mean, they can pretty much override the system for most of the products uh, at any time. So it, it depends on what type of product you're talking about. So if it's something as simple as a, um, you know, just a load control module sitting on a water heater. I mean, if, if they turn off that, that module, then it pretty much is an override right there. Uh, for something that's a little more involved, like your, uh, like a, an ETS unit, which has a certain mode of operation, if it's, if it's uh, synced to the aggregator, um, then it pretty much will follow the, the signal. Uh, but if it's in a manual mode, then that's pretty much an overwrite right there. So there's, there's, there's no real uh, mechanism, you know, that will allow us to time when an instruction goes to uh, the end device uh, in relation to when a customer can overwrite. Thank you, Praveen. Uh, and last question, um, do you have any insight into how the CEA 2045 standard in other standards may influence integration? So uh, the, we, we did look at a little bit of the existing standards that you know we thought may or may not be applicable at the, uh, the start of the project, but then we soon discovered that uh, for, for, for a bunch of reasons, keeping in mind that this is um, a, a research and demonstration project. Uh, and uh, you know the other constraints with budget and all that, we, we decided to keep things fairly simple, and that's when we came with our own uh, project specification, which is uh, very simple to the point. This talks about the you know this like the bare bones needed to get this thing up and running. Uh, so we didn't we didn't really do any extensive research. We did look at things like you know open ADR and, and uh, that briefly, but we soon understood that it might be overkill for what we're looking for here. So as Michelle mentioned earlier, one of the one of the things where this this kind, the work we do here would drive is basically more research into what exists today in terms of those standards, uh, how where they may or may not be applicable, what what needs to change, and that would drive. I would think it drive even new standards out there in the marketplace, in the industry. And I just to quick quickly add to that. I think one of the really important things with this project is we do have you know 1,270 loads customers out there with with multiple loads connected to a virtual power plant that's doing load smoothing today. And we're getting very little customer flack or noise back. You know, and I think there's all kinds of ways we can think about some of these broader um, expansions in the future and, and, and degrees of sophistication. No question, this is not a commercial product. But it works. I think that's the key here. It works, and this is entirely possible. So as we set policy going forward and future research projects going forward, in demonstrations, we got to look at okay. So, what's the next step? So, and, and you know, how do we, how do we cement some of this stuff a little, a little more concrete going forward? I think there's a, but there's there's some huge learnings here from end to end, in a vertically integrated utility setting. Great. Thanks again, uh, Michelle and Praveen. We had a couple more questions uh, come in, but unfortunately we don't have time to address those. So what I'll do is I will um, forward those through email to Praveen and Michelle, and um, they can get back to the attendees uh, in their sure. own time when they have a chance, if that's all right. Yep, sounds good. Okay. Great. Um, so before we close out, I'd just like to ask the attendees um, to participate in a quick survey that we have. It's just three short questions to evaluate 
how we um, did with the webinar and improve for future ones. And the first question is the webinar content provided me with useful information and insight. Great, and the next question is the webinar's presenters were effective. And then the final question is, overall, the webinar met my expectations. Great. Thank you very much for um, answering our survey questions. And on behalf of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, I would just like to again thank uh, Jen, Michelle, and Praveen for um, presenting in today's webinar and also for our attendees for joining us and uh, do invite everyone to check the cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training uh, page if you'd like to download PDF copies of today's presentations and we will also be posting an audio recording of the webinar to that page as well. Um, in addition, this uh, webinar will be posted to the Clean Energy Solutions Center YouTube page. Uh, that is the bottom link on the slide that you're seeing right now. We have other webinars out there as well, um, and also links to videos with um, clean energy policy thought leaders. And so with that, I'd just like to uh, hope everyone has a great rest of your day, and see you again at future Clean Energy Solutions Center events. And this concludes our webinar.